coming up on Rambler Report, an update on the graffiti found in Damon Student Center, and an important day for Loyola basketball. Welcome to another edition of Rambler Report. I'm Isabella Grosso. And I'm Blake Hall. We have an update regarding the investigation on the anti-Semitic imagery found on Loyola University Chicago's campus in early February. Last month, a student reported the finding of a swastika drawn in the Hillel Social Room in Damon Student Center. Just this week, Vice President for Student Development Keith Champagne sent communications to the Loyola community stating that a suspect has been found responsible for other offensive imagery in the Hillel Room, but the, not the swastika in question. The student is no longer a part of the university, and Loyola cannot disclose specific details of the outcome, but promises to remain diligent in combating anti-Semitism. Also just this week, Chicago's Trump Tower was targeted with an anti-Israel pro-Palestinian graffiti. Messages including Free Palestine, Trump for Palestine, and Israel bombs, USA pays, were spotted Sunday and removed by Monday. The incident happened on a lower level of Trump Tower overlooking the Chicago River, which raises questions on the security and the motive. Chicago police have not yet provided details on the incident. And on to happier news, the Ramblers are getting ready for their first game of the A-Town Conference. Natalie King and Sarah Mahaney are in Brooklyn for the tournament. I'm here at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn covering the Atlantic 10 men's basketball tournament for Rambler Report and Rambler Sports Locker. Number two seed Loyola will take on number seven seed St. Bonaventure at 5 p.m. Eastern time today. If Loyola wins this game, they'll take on the winner of game 11 at 3.30 Eastern time on Saturday. This is Loyola's second year in the Atlantic 10 tournament, and the Ramblers are hoping for a better result this year after getting knocked out in the first round last year. For Ramblers Report, I'm Natalie King. Bonnies or not, the Ramblers have a strong season to look back on. William Bazone has a story on the team's unexpected rise to the top this year for the top of their conference. The Ramblers defeated the LaSalle Explorers by a score of 64-54 in the final game of the regular season and celebrated with fans in front of their third straight sellout crowd. With their win and a loss by the Richmond Spiders, Loyola officially claimed a share of the regular season championship. The Ramblers finished with a record of 23-8 this season, a 13-win increase from 15th place just one year ago, their first season in the A-10. Drew Valentine and his team were predicted to finish a middling 8th place this season. Loyola alum Andrew Buckholz is the co-host of a Loyola fan podcast, Podcast 63. He believes the unselfish play is what helped the Ramblers climb back to the top of the standings. No one cares who scores the ball. That is so important. Anyone can score 25 on any given night. You got five, six, seven guys that could, could score 25. Um, and that is, I think, the biggest um, callback to some of the, to the Loyola teams of, of uh, old. Valentine also went back to what made him a household name to begin with, defense. The Ramblers ranked within the top 25 nationally in Ken Pomeroy's rating charts. They also topped the A-10 in defensive categories like blocked shots and opponent field goal percentage. The Ramblers will ride their physical style of play into the conference tournament this week. Loyola junior Nick Newmeyer is a beat writer for the team at NBC Sports Chicago and believes the Ramblers could keep up their historic run if they make some noise in Brooklyn and get back to March Madness. Should they get into the tournament, though, I would not discount uh, not a deep run, but I, I think they're more than capable of winning multiple games in the tournament this year if they make it there. Although head coach Drew Valentine didn't win Atlantic 10 Coach of the Year, he's brought national attention back to the program in Rogers Park. Will they make their third NCAA tournament appearance in the last four years? Only time will tell. For Ramble Report, I'm William Bazone. Many analysts believe the Ramblers will need to win the conference tournament to reach the NCAA tournament. The selection show is on Sunday at 5 p.m., just a few hours after the A-10 championship wraps up in Brooklyn. The women's basketball A-10 tournament was last week. The Ramblers won their quarterfinal game but lost the semifinals. They, they finished the season with just under 500. It's election time in Chicago next week, and an issue on the primary ballot is the Bring Chicago Home referendum. It calls for increased tax rates on property valued over $1 million. 
extra revenue would be used to provide affordable housing and support services for unhoused Chicagoans. It was placed on the ballot by the City Council in November, but a group representing high-end property owners sued the city, and a county judge ordered it off the ballot last month. An appellate court rejected the decision last week, and just this week, the Illinois Supreme Court upheld the appellate decision to keep the issue on the ballot. The primary election is less than a week away. Have you, have you decided how you will vote? Some have opted to vote by mail, but the deadline for those applications closed today at 5 p.m. Other Chicagoans will be voting in person Tuesday, March 19th. According to the Chicago election, election website, voters can go either to their area polling place or one of the 51 voting centers open from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. To learn more about your local polling center, visit chicagoelections.gov backslash voting backslash election day voting. A new, a new development on the new Bears Stadium came out this week. The plan to stay in with the plan to stay in Chicago after all. Previously, there was talk about the Chicago Bears moving to Arlington Heights, a suburb of Chicago, but now those plans have changed as they have committed to putting two billion dollars towards a new stadium just south of the already existing one where the parking lot currently sits. This stadium would be privately financed but publicly owned. The new plan comes with backlash from the Chicago Parks Group, Friends of Friends at the Park who want the stadium to be built further inland from the lake by the former Michael Reese Hospital site. Stay tuned, there could be a fight ahead. Stay tuned for a throwback Thursday to the start of the pandemic and what students have to say about it four years later. And a look at the, and a look at the power of music. We'll be right back. They said I would never become a doctor. They said my skin was too dark. I should straighten my hair. They thought my nose was too big. They counted me out too many times to count. Because I fight to be heard, they call me an angry black woman. My hair was distracting. I would never start my own business. I say my skin empowers me. Take it or leave it. I say don't touch my hair. I am a black doctor. I own my own practice, and because of this, I'm changing lives every single day. My blackness is empowering. My skin, my hair, my confidence, my culture, my community is empowering. So believe it. So believe it. So believe it. This week marked an important milestone. It has now been four years since the CDC declared COVID-19 a pandemic. Let's take a look back at our final Rambler report of March 2020 before the pandemic un upended students' lives. Welcome back to Loyola News Chicago. I'm Michael Faso, and here's the news. Loyola has joined the list of universities that are taking action on the growing coronavirus epidemic. In an email from the Office of the President, Loyola has canceled all face-to-face -face classes. Virtual classes will begin Friday and continue on until the end of the semester. All students living on campus must be gone by the end of the day on Thursday, March 19th. Students living on campus who may have some challenges moving out and getting home can contact Resident Life to request more time. No decision on graduation ceremonies has been made yet, but students will be finding out no later than April 3rd. And by the way, not only was the in-person graduation canceled that spring, it was also canceled the next spring, too. That week was filled with uncertainty for all the Loyola community and the world. But now, four years later, it's an experience each of us can look back on. Leslie Baraz has the story. The COVID-19 pandemic affected everyone in unique ways. Some Loyola students were in the middle of their high school experiences, and some were just graduating. I honestly remember sitting in my geometry class during my sophomore year and just thinking we were already talking about how other schools in our district were just like shutting down and then our school was just up for some reason. And then we got the announcement and it was like, okay, yay, no more school. I think it's made me a lot more um, self-aware. Uh, you know, being, being in lockdown, it gave me a lot of time to like kind of be on my own and like kind of figure out my own personal goals and like what, what I want to accomplish. College teaches students a lot about themselves, but some might argue that the pandemic taught us just as much. For Rambler Report, this is Leslie Mraz. Thanks, Leslie. According to the CDC, 1.2 million Americans have died from the virus since January 1st, 2020. 
Chicago is experiencing its first measles outbreak since 2019, with three of the city's 10 cases reported at a migrant shelter in Pilsen. The CDC sent a team this week to help local officials control the outbreak and vaccinate people. Officials are saying that when officials are saying that the virus was already spreading in Chicago and wasn't brought in by the migrants. Case numbers have been rising throughout the week, including two cases in Chicago public schools, but a Loyola spokesman took this morning that the virus hasn't reached our campus. Today, many people are looking for ways to stay healthy physically and relive the, relieve the stress of our life. Lucas Kim reports that students of the Loyola Jazz Ensemble have found a way to de-stress and make beautiful music together. Today is just another rehearsal for the Loyola University Chicago Jazz Ensemble. They meet every Monday and Wednesday afternoons. All the students are enthusiastic about attending each rehearsal. Dr. Chris Madsen is the ensemble director and is passionate about making sure each student is enjoying their time in band as well as staying in tempo. The part of it that I am the most interested in is the interaction, the spontaneous interaction between the musicians. You don't really get that in a lot of other styles of music. Matson graduated from the jazz program at the Juilliard School in New York City. He prioritizes creating a vibrant and musical environment for everyone, especially for a student like Asha Egmont. It's brought me towards communities that I never would have been able to kind of meet people in. Um, and it's been this insane creative outlet that has allowed me to feel really comfortable in Chicago. The real question is, why is it so important to practice a performing art? Recent studies suggest that there is a strong link between creating art as well as activities like attending a concert or visiting a museum and improved mental health. Other sources contend that the performing arts serve as a benefit to kids who are involved. This includes quick thinking skills, better control over their anxiety, and high self-esteem. I've been in the Loyola Jazz Ensemble for three years now and it allows me to de-stress and enjoy my passion for music with others who love it just as much as I do. Thanks, Lucas. The Jazz Ensemble Spring Showcase will be on April 19th in the Newark Theater. If you're an aspiring jazz player, auditions will be held during the first week of classes next fall. Chicago and St. Patrick's Day have had a long history together. Starting with the first Irish parade held in 1843, it became an official city event in the 1950s. However, it wasn't until 1962 that the iconic river dying of the Chicago River became a thing. After the first dying, it quickly became one of the most famous Chicago events. If you'd like, if you'd like to watch the river dying, get died, tune into NBC Chicago and watch it live on their app or streaming channel. If you get an in-person view, to get an in-person view, walk along the Chicago River Walk. With Chicago's rich hi Irish history, St. Patrick's legacy is honored in more ways than one. But do Loyola students know who St. Patrick was? Megan Walsh went out at the Water Tower campus to test their knowledge. With St. Patrick's Day on Sunday, we are going to ask Loyola students at the Water Tower campus if they know who St. Patrick really is. Do you know who St. Patrick is? I don't know. My assumption is a uh, Irish leprechaun. It's my guess. Who do you think St. Patrick is? Uh, I honestly don't know. I'm guessing um, some kind of saint in the Catholic Church. All I know about St. Patrick is what I learned in my um, Catholic high school education that he expelled the snakes from Ireland and that's all I remember. That is true. Well that's like the folklore story. I have no idea. I'm assuming he's Irish. So he's a British man who like lived in Ireland Ireland to teach about Christianity. He's like known as the father of Ireland. St. Patrick's Day is the day he's supposed to have died. Okay. So, yeah, cool. Um, that's awesome. Oh, I did not know that. And that's the Sunday. So what do you know about St. Patrick? For Rambler Report, I'm Megan Walsh. Thank you, Megan. She also tells us that only one person knew a folklore on St. Patrick and the snakes. And that wraps up this edition of Rambler Report. To stay up to date, be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Rambler Report LUC. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified when our weekly newscast is released. For Rambler Report, I'm Isabella Grosso. And I'm Blake Hall. We'll catch you next week.